Hi, this is Larry Huppen. I'm a medical consultant at ProLab Orthotics, and in this lecture, we're going to look at an orthotic therapy for plantar fasciitis with the idea to get the best potential clinical outcome for your patient writing orthotic prescriptions for plantar fasciitis. So our goals here, we're going to look at three different studies that, to, that help indicate we should be doing when we're writing an orthotic prescription for patients with plantar fasciitis. Uh, those are studies that look at cause of plantar fascial tension, they look at forefoot wedging, and then finally the, uh, the study, a study that looks at arch contour. And again, our goal here is to come up with the best clinical outcome when we write our, our orthotic prescription. So the first study is from was in uh, Japman 1991 by Shear, and it looked at the effect of joint pronation on plantar fascial strain. Um, an effect noted that subtalar joint pronation doesn't have much effect on strain on the plantar fascia, but in fact, it takes inversion of the forefoot on the rear foot in order to increase tension. Fascia. That would be uh, supination of the long axis of the metarsal joint or first ray dorsiflexion. So let's look at the effect of forefoot inversion on plantar fascial strain. In this study, they had 73 patients with 118 painful heels. 91% of these patients actually had a foot deformity that compensated by supination along the tarsal joint or first ray dorsiflexion. So when that happens, the, basically the first ray will elevate and that lengthens the increases tension on the plantar fascia. In the study, they found three foot types that lead to supination of the mid-tarsal joint. Um, the first was the forefoot valgus, and essentially what happens here is if you look at this picture, uh, this uh, box represents the calcus. Obviously, these are the metatarsal heads, and in forefoot valgus, the medial aspect of the foot here hits the ground sooner, harder, for a longer period of time. That thus elevates the, the, um, the first ray, lengthens the arch, and increases tension on the plantar fascia. The second most common foot type was the everted heel. And here what happens is the calcaneus everts. It jams that medial forefoot into the ground. Ground reactive force elevates the first ray. Again, that lengthens the arch and that increases tension on the plantar fascia. And finally, we have the plantar flex first ray. Again, much like that first one, the forefoot valgus, in this situation, the first metatarsal head hits the ground sooner, hits harder, hits for a longer period of time. That elevates first ray and, uh, and supinates the long axis of the metatarsal joint. That lengthens the arch of the foot and that intention on the plantar fascia. So again, to summarize that study, they had um, found that 115 out of 133 of these patients had one of the deformities that would force the foot into a position of inversion on the rear foot, on the, of the rear foot upon weight bearing. And the, they theorized it was supination of the metarsal joint that placed tension on the plantar fascia. So a final summary on that, it's not subtalar joint pronation because you can actually pronate your subtalar joint right now, do that non-weight find that does not increase the length of the arch or increase tension on the plantar fascia. But if you were to either elevate the first ray or to supinate the metarsal joint, you would find that almost essentially 100% of the time that will lengthen the arch of the foot and increase on the plantar fascia. Our second study was, uh, was done by Cogler. It was published in 1999. And in this study, he took fresh frozen cadaver feet and put them in this machine right here that would load them. Then what he did, he put wedges under the forefoot and under the heel. He put wedges under the medial forefoot and the lateral forefoot, under the medial heel and the lateral heel, and then he did a combination of those wedges. He put a strain gauge within the plantar and then he measured what was the tension in the plantar fascia and how did it change based on what was under the foot. At the top here, we see the wedges that were used. Here we have the varus wedge under the heel and then a valgus wedge under the heel. Varus forefoot and a valgus forefoot wedge. We have varus forefoot and rear foot. We have a valgus forefoot and rear foot. And then finally, we have the valgus forefoot with a varus heel and a varus wedge with a valgus wedge under the heel. Now, what's interesting here is that what was the most interesting finding here was that it was those forefoot lateral wedges, valgus wedges under the forefoot, that quite dramatically decreased tension in the plantar fascia. While medial forefoot wedges, varus wedges under the forefoot, quite dramatically increased tension under or within the plantar fascia. 
So the summary here is that you, with these wedges, you saw decreased tension in the plantar fascia with lateral forefoot wedging, increased with medial forefoot wedging, and the rear foot wedges really had almost no significant effect. So a quote from Cog, the most effective way to decrease strain on the plantar fascia is to evert the forefoot. And we'll certainly take that into account in a few minutes when we start writing our orthotic prescription. The final study was also by Cogler, published in 1996. Uh, and in this study, he, he did a similar setup where he took the fresh frozen cadaver legs machine that would load them. But this time, he was looking at different shaped orthoses under the arch of the foot and their effect on tension on the plantar fascia. So once again, he put a strain gauge within the plantar fascia, five different orthotic devices under the arch to see which ones decreased tension on the plantar fascia the most effectively. These are the five devices. First one was just a, a little wedge uh, and then different materials. Here we have over here a, a UCBL type. Here is a standard uh, root type of orthosis. But it didn't really matter what the material was or whether it was a root device or UCBL. But critical was how closely the orthosis conformed to the, to the arch of the foot. The tighter that device conform to the arch, the less tension there was on the plantar fascia. So another quote from Cogler uh, that the orthoses which decreased plantar aponeurosis strain had closest surface contours of the medial and central regions and the angles related to their arch shape were more acute. So if we look at these two pictures, here we have an orthosis that is away from the arch. Here we have one that conforms very close to the arch of the foot. And what Cogler was saying is that this device that conforms close to the arch is more likely to decrease tension on fascia. So let's start talking about the orthotic devices themselves. Our goal is reduce tension on the plantar fascia. And based on the studies we've seen, first thing we want to do is prevent first ray dorsiflexion. We want to incorporate valgus correction. We want to maintain close contour. And if the heel's everted, we want to reduce that heel eversion. So first thing we need to look at is the casting technique. There's actually some interesting information on this we can take from the Cogler study on um, how orthoses conform to the arch of the foot. He found that to control the longitudinal arch, the medial arch of the orthosis must stabilize the bony structures of the arch. And he said it was advantageous to position the foot so its medial arch is elevated during negative impression procedures to maximize orthotic control. So he was saying that when you're taking the cast, here we're positioning the foot uh, as if we were going to cast, plantar flex that first ray and or dorsiflex the hallux in order to bring that first ray down. In order to maximize arch heights and we get the orthosis back, it conforms very close to the arch of the foot. So the casting technique should be non-weight bearing and we want to either plantar flex the first ray and or dorsiflex the hallux and then whether you use plaster or whether you use a, a laser scan of the foot. Non-weight bearing and plantar flex that first ray along with keeping the subtalar joint neutral and the um, axle joint locked in its maximally pronated position. So now we're going to move on to the orthotic prescription. Here we're going to look at what material to make the orthotic out of. We're going to look at how large the orthosis should be, uh, posit fill, cast corrections, post top covers, and finally we'll look at forefoot extensions to try and come up with the best potential clinical outcome uh, for your orthotic device. All right. So shell material, the main thing here is the material should be enough to resist deformation. If it is overly flexible, it's going to collapse under the arch of the foot and it's going to allow that arch to lengthen. That's going to increase tension on the plantar fascia. So th there's a number of materials that would be effective. Probably two of the most common would be polypropylene and carbon fiber materials. But again, most important thing, it just has to be rigid enough to resist deformation. Now we'll look at the size of the orthosis. This really depends on whether the heel is everted and you need to decrease or uh, decrease the eversion of the heel. If the heel's fairless and it's not everted, you can probably use a standard heel cup and a standard width. If the heel happens to be everted, however, you're going to want to do more to try and reduce that eversion. So in that situation, you're going to want to use a deep heel cup and a wide width. 
In addition, if the heel's inverted, you want to think about using a medial heel skive. What the medial skive is, is a varus wedge within the, me within the medial heel cup of the orthosis. Cross-section of an orthotic with, uh, here's lateral on this side, here's medial, and you'll just notice that the medial side here is flatter. Right, so what that has done is it shift, it's going to shift the center of force farther medial to the joint axis, and that's going to mean that the force is applied farther medial. That's going to give you a longer lever arm relative to the, relative to the subtalar joint axis and a greater supinatory torque. What this four millimeters here means is that this was a four millimeters, how deep we go down on the positive cast in order to create an orthosis that has that wedge built in. Here's a, a representation of it down here. This section presents the talus and the tibia. Here's the axis of the subtalar joint. Right? So by putting that varus wedge under there, that's going to shift that center of force further medial to the subtalar joint axis. And again, that goes, that's going to give us a greater lever arm away from the axis and a greater supinatory torque around the axis to help prevent excessive pronation. So the medial heel scribe is a very effective method to try and decrease excessive rear foot, uh, excessive pronation and um, excessive heel eversion. Next question is how tight should the orthosis conform to the arch of the foot? Well, again, going back to Cogler's sec second study, was that orthoses that raise the TNJ and prevent dorsiflexion of the distal strut, meaning the first ray, are most effective reducing strain on the central band of the plantar fascia. Here's an orthosis, uh, and this little gray block right here, this purple block, helps show basically that it raises the TN joint, which lets the first ray plantar flex. This demonstrates an orthosis that would conform closer to the arch of the foot. That in turn is going to allow decreased tension on the plantar fascia. Now, how do you write a prescription to accommodate that or to accomplish that? A couple things you can do. Number one, prescribe a minimum cast fill. Now, this is looking at an old-fashioned plaster cast, but this gives a good representation. The blue here was the initial plaster poured into the negative cast. The white is what's been added. So this one that's close, there's quite a bit of white added in the arch. That means we've added a maximum amount of arch fill. That's going to mean that when the orthosis is made off this cast, it's going to gap away from the arch of the foot. Whereas this one back here, there's a minimum amount of arch fill added, meaning that when the orthosis is made off of that device, it is going to conform you're going to have a higher arch and will conform closer to the arch of the foot. So again, prescribe a minimum. And this is really key. Make sure your lab does not overfill the medial arch. In a second, I'll show you how to confirm that they are not doing that. Because um, if you do have excess plaster added in here, you're definitely going to have an orthosis that has a lower arch and will not be as effective at decreasing tension plantar fascia. Now, the second method you can use to increase the arch height of the orthosis is to use an inverted cast technique. And you can see here, this cast is thicker under the first and thinner under the fifth, meaning that it is inverted. That means an orthosis off of this cast has to drop farther to the ground and has a higher arch. My standard prescription for patients with plantar fasciitis would be a minimum cast fill with maybe two or three degrees of inversion incorporated. Now the way you know that you've got what you prescribed, so if you have prescribed that type of orthosis that should conform close to the arch of the foot, is to analyze the orthosis when it gets back. You want to put that foot back in casting position, plantar flex the first ray, and you should see that the orthotic device conforms very close to the arch of the foot if you prescribed it with a minimum fill and particularly with minimum fill and a little bit of inversion. If you see that it gaps from the arch, you have to assume the lab overfilled the, the positive cast when they were making that device. And so now we have an orthosis that may not conform well to the arch of the foot and would not do as good of a job at decreasing tension on the plantar fascia. Finally, we look at forefoot extensions. Uh, cog we look go back to Cogler's study on um, valgus and wedging, decreasing tension on the plantar fascia. And here we're going to prescribe a valgus wedge. This demonstrates a wedge here. It's thicker under the fifth, thinner under the under the second and the first. Um, 
Now, if this patient has a true plantar flex first ray, then you may want to consider the first Morton's extension, which is very similar uh, modification. It's just the same thickness under all of the lesser metatarsal heads. Now, when we're writing the entire prescription, you have to keep in mind uh, one primary thing, or not that heel is everted. So we're really going to have two prescriptions for this problem. One for the patient with a rectus heel, and the second prescription is that going to be for that patient who has an everted heel. So let's look at the first prescription here. This is for a patient who has an everted forefoot for either forefoot valgus or plantar flex first ray, but the heel, the rear foot is fairly stable. So here we might want to use an, uh, a negative cast with the first ray plantar flex. Of course, we're going to use a semi-rigid cell, um, orthotic shell. We're going to use a minimal cast fill. We can use a standard heel cup, a standard width. We don't require a medial heel sky because the heel is not everted. We'll do two degrees of inversion to raise the arch a little bit more so it can further the arch of the foot in order to further decrease tension on the plantar fascia. Uh, a rear foot post to stabilize the, orth the orthosis of the shoe. And for the forefoot extension, we can use a reverse Morton's extension if it's a plantar flex first and a valgus extension if it is a forefoot valgus deformity. Now, in the situation where the heel is everted, and that's going to, again, jam that medial forefoot into the ground. We want to decrease eversion of the heel. So we're going to use the same prescription with a couple of differences. Number one, we're going to use a deeper heel cup. That heel, by heel cup going deeper, it'll apply more force to the medial side of the heel and help decrease the pronatory torque. We're going to use a wider device so we have more surface area under the medial aspect of the foot and have more surface area medial to the subtalar joint axis, again, to reduce eversion of the by applying a greater supinatory torque, and we'll incorporate that medial heel sky. Otherwise, it's the same prescription. So the summary here is you want to use a non-weight-bearing cast. You want to plantar flex the first ray when you're casting, and you want to prescribe an orthosis that conforms very close to the arch of the foot. Use valve extensions or reverse Morton's extensions to further decrease tension on the plantar fascia. Make sure you use an orthotic lab that accurately balances the forefoot to the rear foot. And make sure you use a lab that does very accurate arch fill corrections. And finally, learn to troubleshoot your orthoses just in case there's any arch irritation afterwards. Sometimes with these patients, uh, the arch feels a little bit and you can do some very mild uh, modifications to adjust for that. So if you have any questions, please go to our website, prolaborthotics.com. You can find a tremendous amount of, uh, of information there. Uh, you can also contact us uh, at cslab-usa.com.